Golden Eagle TV, Golden Eagle Radio, bringing it all out, making sure you guys have quality programming, high consciousness, student activity. You know, every culture produces its own keeper, and every culture produces its own principles, its own history, its own advocates, and its own profit, pointing the way to a higher quality of life. Now, for the urban street culture known in the world today as hip hop, KRS One is above all else. <laughs> Yep, ARS is an acronym for Knowledge Rating Supreme has been called the Conscious of Hip Hop by Rolling Stone, the greatest live MC ever by The Source, the spokesperson for Hip Hop by The Wall Street Journal, and master teacher by The Zulu Nation. Now with 20 published albums to his credit and his numerous appearances and other artists, KRS One has literally written the most rhymes in Hip Hop history. In the 90s, as the Hip Hop genre grew, and it got more commercialized and corporate. It was KRS-One who openly rejected that more commercialized and corporate nature and the cultural exploitation and grounded hip hop in its original principles of peace, love, unity, and safely just having a good time. You know, teaching everything from self-creation, stopping violence, from vegetarianism to transcendental meditation, from the establishment of the Hip Hop Appreciation Week, to establishing hip hop as an international culture at the United Nations, KRS One has single handedly held the history and original arts of hip hop together now for over two decades. Now, in addition to lecturing at over 500 universities in the US and publishing three groundbreaking books, KRS One has established Stop the Violence Movement, influenced the creation of the West Coast All Stars anti gang anthem, We're All in the Same Gang, warned the hip hop community against giving up their humanity for technological advancement has established the Temple of Hip Hop for the spiritual exploration of hip hop culture. Now it's KRS-One who first argued that rap is something we do and hip hop is something we live. He introduced I Am Hip Hop philosophy, which Black Entertainment Television uses as the title of their Hip Hop Lifetime Achievement Award to this day. And without question, KRS-One has been the loudest voice for the actual preservation and expansion of hip hop worldwide and is unquestionably the most influential hip hop icon ever, ladies and gentlemen, Garris One. Wow, wow. Who was that you was talking about? I, I'd like to meet that guy. I thank you all. Please be seated. And whenever you record, you have the copyright of it. <laughs> you just have the right, just gave you the rights. You know what, this is, um, oh, okay, well, this, this is fine, this is fine, this is actually working. <laughs> you know, um, usually in a setting like this, uh, I usually start off with like a brief synopsis or history on hip hop so that we know exactly what it is we're talking about. Uh, but. Uh, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of thinking that you guys are already up on like the traditional information on hip hop. So for the sake of cameras uh, and those that are recording, I'll just spend maybe five minutes on a brief history of what we're talking about. Now, what we're going to be talking about here today, I got your questions. Uh, usually what I like to do is for you to walk out here with a, walk out of here with a changed consciousness. Uh, and not just changed, but it, it, it more enhanced. Uh, the object of this talk is for you to leave here with a broader view about not only culture, but ethnicity, race, activism, civilization versus technology. These areas are the areas we're going to discuss, and hip hop is at the center of all of that. And I mean, the center. People front, like, you know, hip hop is peripheral or some subculture. No. Hip hop is at the center of these uh, themes that I just mentioned. What's going to help us, you guys have helped us. Some of you have given me questions, and I usually ask for questions at the beginning so that I can speak. I could tailor make this conversation to the audience itself. I could go on for days with facts and stuff, but it's always best to answer questions that the audience itself is, is, is asking, students themselves, teachers even are asking, and then I could form the, the lecture around that. 
Uh, that is the structure of how we're going to get down. If your mind can take it, I will now begin. <laughs> Hip hop, what is it? What? <sighs> I can leave now. <laughs> he said, I said hip hop. He said, what? I said, what is it? He said, life. There it is. End of the lecture, right there. <laughs> hip hop is life. Let's start with culture. In the sense that when we say the word hip hop, hip hop, capital H, lowercase i, lowercase p, space, capital H, lowercase o, lowercase p, hip hop, we are talking about breaking, MCing, graffiti writing, DJing, beatboxing. Stop here. These elements, or actually I should say breaking, MCing, graffiti writing, DJing, are called the core four elements of hip hop established by Africa Bambada in 1974, and then again with James Brown in 1981. The reason we do break in MC and graffiti art and DJing is to cause peace, love, unity, and safely having fun. This is the reason for hip hop. It's the reason why we did it originally. We were growing up in the 70s in a time where our, our self-expression was being ignored by the mainstream. We, we weren't in television, we were nowhere in magazines, nowhere in media, nowhere in education, nowhere in even justice and things like medicine and like that, like with the hip hop was like, what you see today, hip hop is everywhere. Imagine the complete opposite in 1973. Hip hop is nowhere. In fact, the name hip hop is like me saying to you today, Gabaga. Gaba guy. I say, what, what, what is that you're doing? Gaba guy. <laughs> and the same way you react is the same way the mainstream reacted to us. When we're spinning on our head, hitting up the trains. Oh, wait a minute, let me slow down. For those that aren't bilingual, <laughs> we are spraying graffiti on the spray cans on the side of trains in New York City. They were parked in the train yard. We used to go to the train yard and put our names up on the side of the train. Then the next day, you'd see your name dry, go by on the side of trains. And this was like a cultural competition that we called aerosol art. Mainstream called it graffiti art. We never called it graffiti art. We called it graffiti writing, aerosol art, bombing, tagging, etc. Try to remember this. It'll come in handy later on. <laughs> 1973, a Jamaican uh, guy by the name of Clyde comes from Jamaica in 1967, actually, with his family. His father was a mechanic. His mother was a nurse from Jamaica. Uh, they had a, a, two children, brother, sister, Cindy and um, Clyde. Uh, on Cindy's birthday, Cindy asked Clyde to be her DJ. Clyde was a graffiti writer. Uh, and uh, she asked him to DJ her party where they lived. They lived at a place called 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. There was a community center there. They rented it out. And because of Cindy asking her brother Clyde to DJ for her, he changed his name from writing Cool Ass Clyde, Cool Ass Clyde, to uh, Cool Her. He started calling himself Cool DJ Herc. Why Herc? Because Herc is short for Hercules. This dude was big and he had muscles and her neighborhood was just, just called him Hercules. So his DJ name became Cool DJ Herc. What he would do is take James Brown's record specifically and this other record called Apache by the Amazing Bongo Band. And he would just play the breaks of these records over and over and over again in this style that he called the merry-go-round. And the merry-go-round was a mixture of Jamaican-style DJing. See, let me go back up, make sure you got this. In Jamaica, there's a thing called sound systems. And these sound systems are DJs with their own sound system, speakers, amps, etc. They would come out in a big yard, even bigger than this, and they would set up their sound system and play reggae music. Now they would play the regular reggae of the day, but then if you flip the record over, there was something called a version. 
And the version was the instrumental of that record. They flipped the record over and some other dude would come and start saying anything to the crowd to get the crowd roused up. The selector, which is what you call a DJ today, was called a selector. This person would be using the mixer to throw the music in. So if the music went ba 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 if it went like that, he would take the mixer and go bum 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 bum. He wouldn't let the the music go bum 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 bum. He wouldn't let it do that. Now. Cool Herc brings that to the United States. His sister's party begins. August 11th, 1973, nine o'clock in the afternoon, I mean in the evening, for 25 cent, hip hop began. Cool Herc started playing the breaks of records. Now how do I know this? Because I lived across the street. <laughs> in, in 1973, I was eight years old and I lived across the street. I was there in 1600 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. Cool Herc lived at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue and I could see his building from my window. Now he threw his party, but I couldn't get in. I was too young and I couldn't afford it. It was 25 cents to get in. <laughs> Big money in those days. <laughs> Couldn't afford it. So Cool Hurt started doing these parties every weekend. The first one was great. He made some money. He said, let me do this again and again and again. The parties got so big that he had to take them outside. That's when little guys like me got a chance to join in on this new thing that they called the jam. It was just called a jam. No flyers, nothing. It was just called a jam. Funky drama or something. A one, two, three, four, hit it. Boom, boom. And you just look out your window, you listen, you say, that sounds like it's coming from 123 Park. Or no, that sounds like it's coming from Wingate Park. No. And then you'd have to walk around the neighborhood and find where the sound was coming from. This is how, this is the early days of hip hop. In that time, we're all dressing like Bruce Lee. <laughs> you can laugh if you want to. This is real. Everybody in early hip hop in the Bronx was Bruce Lee. Everybody. 1973, it's very hard. First of all, Bruce Lee was not just a uh, kung fu martial artist to the hood, to the Bronx ghetto. He was a, a more like a mythical hero. And the reason being, is because first of all, he knew Kung Fu and that just went over well with every kid in, the, in, 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 in urban areas. And he just did it like that. Bruce Lee also, if you look at his movies, there's one called um, uh, Enter the Dragon, 1973. And at the beginning of Enter the Dragon, they, they, they have a golden issue series that they put out right now. But at the beginning of, of uh, uh, Enter the Dragon, there's a dialogue between Bruce Lee and a Shaolin uh, monk, a, a teacher actually, a priest. And, and Bruce Lee's getting ready to leave the Shaolin temple. And he's asking him things like, you know, what is the greatest crime? And uh, to not be true to yourself. And well, what is the, the punishment of a traitor? Death. Uh, what is the, and he goes on and on with this. They cut that out of, out of the movie. But in the hood, we sense that this is what Bruce Lee was all about. Discipline, having the skills to break anybody down, but we loved his discipline. And this is like part of hip hop that people don't remember. Wu-Tang Clan keeps this tradition alive today. Why are they so into Shaolin? Why are they so in? Because this was the first thing we were in hip hop. This was the beginning of it. What Wu-Tang and them are doing is what Cool Herc was doing in 73. They just they just doing it in their way, Long Island style, you know, and so on. But uh, but no, but this but but I need to say that for you to understand the cultural significance of how our culture came to be. Bruce Lee and his attitude, his character, is what hip hop was trying to mimic in 1973. He had Bruce Kelly with him. 
young black kids in the hood. We never seen no black dude with an afro doing karate, beating up the police <laughs> on the TV. We was like, wow, Bruce Lee, wow, look. And this went over well with us. We used to dress like him, talk like him, beat each other up like him. <laughs> I mentioned this, keep this in mind, okay? This is Cool Herc Seller. This is 73. This is the Vietnam War also. This is heroin everywhere, everywhere. It's heroin everywhere. Planted there by the FBI, by the way. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it then, but now we know the counterintelligence program and all of that, and J. Edgar Hoover and all of that. Now we know who put the, put the drugs in, in, in the community, but then nobody knew. It was just everywhere. And hip hop was an escape. It was an escape. If you could break a b-boy, b-girl, if you could dance, if you could do graph, if you could MC, if, if you could do what Cool Herc was doing, which is basically lifting the needle up, dropping it again at the front of the break. One, two, three, four, hit it. Boom, boom, bop, boom, 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 One, two, three, four. One, two, three, needle dropping. That's what he used to do back in the days. And that was the first break. That was the first, what we call cutting and scratching today. That was the first type of it. The first type of loop was a human being doing it with his hand on a turntable. His name was Cool Herc. From Cool Herc, we get Africa Bambada. Africa Bambada comes in 1974 with Zulu Nation. He started something called the organization first, then jumped into Zulu Nation. Why? He was, first of all, I, I'll spare you his history. You can go online and see his whole history. The, the transformation from gang leader to cultural leader, his trip to Africa, how he got his name, what his name means. All that's online. There's tons of books on it. I'm speeding up. 1974, Africa Bambada comes out with Zulu Nation. And Zulu Nation, like I said before, are the ones that established hip-hop as a culture, as something we was going to live our lives by. How did this happen? Africa Bambada was a visionary. He saw what hip-hop was back in 74. And he told all the gangs in New York, listen, the more we shoot and robbing and stealing and killing each other, none of us are going to be anything. When None of us are going to go anywhere. Everyone agreed and they formed a new thing called Zulu Nation. Within Zulu Nation, which is all these gang members that just put down the rag, put down the gun, and they said, we're gonna do something positive. The whole city of New York, if you could just imagine that for a minute. Thousands of people that were part of different gangs fighting each other. This dude, Africa Bambada, comes up and says, we have a new plan. You could change your life by becoming an MC, a DJ, a B-boy, a graph writer, and so on, and you don't have to die in the street. All the gang members said, yes, we're doing this. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a guy named Lovebug Starsky, a DJ, part of Zulu Nation. He starts calling the movement hip-hop. He starts putting it in his rhymes, hip, hop, hip, hop. He starts saying it like that. Then this is what Africa Bambada then took from Love Buck Starsky. He's got, he kept saying it in his rhymes and so on. And Africa Bambada said, that's what the name of this is called, hip hop. He started using it. What is this called? Hip hop. Breaking them, seeing graffiti or DJing. What is this called? Hip hop. Now, what's interesting about hip hop is that it matches nature identically. We keep thinking of hip hop as a music genre. And that's hip hop, lowercase h, lowercase i, lowercase p, space, or dash, lowercase h, lowercase o, lowercase p. That's the music genre. Anytime you're spelling hip hop, spell it with a capital H, two capital H's, because it's the name of a culture. Most of the uh, magazines today, when, when you talk about what can we do in terms of activism uh, with hip hop, spell it with a capital H, just something little, just like that. When you become the editors of magazines or the, the executives of television shows where hip hop has to be spelled a certain way, always spell it with a capital H. It'll show other intellectuals and cultural studies students that you care about this as a culture. 
Those that don't care about hip hop as a culture and keep it as a music genre, they spell it in lowercase letters. Source Magazine, Double XL, Rolling Stone Vibe, MTV, etc. All of that is hip hop in lowercase letters. Anytime you see something scholarly done on hip hop, hip hop will be capital H, lowercase i, lowercase p, space, capital H, lowercase o, lowercase p. So Africa Bambata turns this into a culture by adding principles. Peace, love, unity, and safely having fun. That's why we break MC, graffiti right, DJ. This is the reason for it. Now, if you're not seeking peace, love, unity, and joy, there's no reason to be rapping, breaking, graffiti writing, DJ. There's no reason for it. This is what's going on today. I'm sorry to say, a lot of the guys that you see or hear about or see on television, hear about on the radio, they have no reason to rap. Mm -hmm. This is what begins the laws right here. This is what begins the cultural laws. Back in the days, people used to request that you rap. You'd be that dude walking down the street and somebody says, yo, kick a rhyme. And you could be in the bread and cheese aisle of, of Ralph somewhere. <laughs> Yo, spit your ramen. It has to come out right there. <laughs> that guy was always requested to rhyme. Requested to rhyme. Today, rappers are not requested to rhyme. They're forcing their rhymes on you. They're, you're not asking them to rap for you. <laughs> They're just rapping. And it's not even them, really. It's their marketing and promotions team that's really pushing the music for a profit. But this, of course, brings us away from the cultural aspect. Let me come back to them. Just, I'm talking about the cultural mechanics of hip hop in, in its early days. Uh, let me jump from this, you get the point on this. Let me continue after Africa Bambada. Grandmaster Flash is who I want to come to. Uh, because this, this, com this is what I mean about hip hop matching nature. This genius, uh, uh, we call him uh, Grandmaster Flash. Um, his name is Gordon Williams. He was first called DJ Flash. He took his name from Flash Gordon. He used to be a comic book strip, some dude fast, running around. He could run fast, his name was Flash Gordon. He was running around saving people. Uh, he took his name from that, his name was Gordon Williams, so he called himself Flash Gordon, because he's the fastest DJ. But what he was doing was taking the techniques of Africa Bambata and uh, Cool Herc, and just modifying them, the same needle dropping, blending of music, mixing music with two different turntables, and that kind of thing. But here's the genius. Gordon Williams is a certified electrician, start, before DJ. He's a certified electrician, and he can't get a job. This is a little cultural, this is cultural hip hop right here. The people who invented hip hop, Africa Bambada, or I should say put it in order, Cool Herc, Africa Bambada, Grandmaster Flash. <coughs> Stop there. These three people, and, and all the people that they inspired could have done anything with their life, with their mind, with their talent. Many of us were doctors, many of us were lawyers, engineers, many of us were entrepreneurs and so on, but the racist society that we were living in at the time would not allow any African American free entrance into any mainstream institution in the United States. You don't live in this reality here today. It's still floating around, but not to the degree it was in the 70s. Sure, there were black uh, uh, intellectuals, black doctors, of course, but they were classed as like, like the exception. You know, oh look, a black doctor. That kind of thing. Uh, this was, you know, everybody else who wanted to study medicine or law or engineering or something like that, you were literally discouraged from it. So you look at a person like Cool Herc, he's a car mechanic. Herc has the abilities to break down a car, build cars, but he couldn't get a job like that, so he became a DJ. Africa Bambada is a writer, journalist. He, matter of fact, the reason he was in Africa is because he won a UNICEF writing contest. Gang member, head of the biggest gang in New York, 
took up a writing contest and won it. I mean, these people are amazing people. Won the writing contest, went to Africa, had an epiphany, came back, and now he's Africa Bambana. <laughs> but he's a writer that could never think about getting a job at the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and none of that. N never think about Hollywood writing. N he couldn't even imagine himself there. He became a DJ and a community organizer. Grandmaster Flash, like I was saying, is a certified electrician, but can't get a job. He's a black man, but he's certified, he's dope, he's good at what he does, but no one cares about that. You're black, you ain't getting in. So he's a messenger for, for a department store called Crantex Fabrics. He's a messenger on a bike. Now imagine, brilliant mind, scientific mind. He's a messenger. He's delivering messages back and forth while he's delivering the messages. He says, how can I keep a record playing from one to the other seamlessly, not like how Cool Herc do it, because there might be a break in the middle, the, the mix could be off a little. How do you make this record, the break, just continuously play? This is what he's thinking about while he's riding a bike as a messenger. Okay, he discovers that the, there are mixers that, are, that do exist, but they're not used by DJs and all that. Yeah, not, DJs are still using amps and knobs and stuff like that. Crossfaders are not in existence like for DJs yet. This guy takes a mic toggle switch, or often it's, a, it's like a, a ball switch with one little thing at the top. You click it this way, it's on. Click it this way, it's off. He's an electrician. He opened it up, made on left and off right, and now you click, you hear this turntable, click here, you hear this turntable. Now the battle at Disco Fever. <laughs> Flash shows up with this little click, click, click thing and started cutting, scratching records. Now, Africa Bambada and Cool Herc were doing the same thing. That you, to, to cue the record, you have to bring it back. So in their headphones, they would hear, they would hear it, but they would never let the crowd hear it. It was illegal, it was immoral, it was wrong to let the crowd hear you going, that was like the cue up. You, you don't let nobody hear you cue it up. Flash let everybody hear him cueing up. That was the trick. He just, instead of you not hearing, he lets you hear it. Boom. And you would be like, wow. Now imagine this. No one on the planet is doing this. I'm going to give you a minute to meditate on that. It's difficult for this generation to actually, you don't understand, no one on earth <laughs> No one, there's this guy, he invents this thing, cutting and scratching with a mic toggle switch. He's the first. What does he do? He says, I'm gonna give this freely to all the kids in my neighborhood so they can have a skill and become somebody. Stop here. Now, to this day, Grandmaster Flash hasn't received a patent. He owns nothing. Panasonic, Sony, Toshiba, all of them have taken his idea. Every crossfader you see on a mixer is Grandmaster Flash's idea. He's never been paid for this, never. But it was him that said at the beginning, this is what hip hop needs. These little kids run eight year olds if they can learn to do this, no DJ will be. This is flat. You should bring him here. Let him tell you <laughs> himself. But this is what his inspiration was. Give it to the community and let them have it, and we'll all grow on that. Same thing with Africa Bambada. Let's organize the whole community around these principles so the young ones grow up in something strong. Same thing with cool DJ Hurt. Brought his party outside. Little guys like me get a chance to get in. Now, 
1979. Hip hop splits. A group by the name of Cool, uh, of uh, the Coal Crush Brothers, the Coal Crush Brothers, huge, one of the first MC groups to unite in hip, probably the F M first MC group, the Coal Crush Brothers, a lot of routines, all of Run DMC's routines, LL Cool J's routines, all that Coal Crush Brothers. Everybody in Sugar Hill, early days, Sugar Hill Records, Coal Crush Brothers, Treacherous Three, Coal Crush Brothers, everybody, Chunky Four Plus One More, Sequence, all of that was influenced by Coal Crush Brothers. The captain of the Coal Crush Brothers is a guy named Grandmaster Kaz, Kaz for Casanova. They was ruling the MC scene in about night, about, well, 77, 78. They're ruling the scene. Flash is the newest DJ. He's now Grandmaster Flash. And he's teaching everybody how to cut, mix, and scratch. Now other DJs are coming up. Grand Mixer DST and, uh, uh, oh man, I, I could go on and on. But anyway, all these DJs start learning Flash's technique of cutting, mixing, and scratching. Now, Flash, uh, I'm sorry, Cold Crush, this guy, Grandmaster Kaz, Casanova, there's a, 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 a group called the Casanovas, the, the, how he was part of it, they called him Casanova, his name was Kaz. Kaz had a manager called Big Bank Hank. Big Bank Hank took Kaz's rhymes and said on the record, Rapper's Delight, I'm the C-A-S and the O-V-A and the rest is F-L-Y. You see, I go by the code of, and this is, someone else's rhymes. Big Bank Hank, if you can spell it all, it, it does not spell out, I'm the C-A-S-O-V-A, the rest is F-L-Y. His name is Big Bank Hank. Why is he saying he's Casanova Fly? Because the rhymes he was using was from Casanova Fly, a guy named Grandmaster Cas, who he managed. He heard him say the rhymes, took the rhymes, and made this record called Rapper's Delight. Now the other guys, Master G and Big Bang Hank, supposedly wrote their rhymes. But uh, yeah, Master G and Wonder Mike supposedly wrote their rhymes. Big Bang Hank, part of his rhymes, a big portion of his rhyme, came from Grandmaster Kaz. When the record blew up, so two million records out the box, rap was on the scene at that minute. We was rapping since 1973, even before that. But the rap we do today is from 73. 79 comes, now America gets to hear rap. Rap, guess what? America, we love you. There's a rock in a row with a summer or so. You can rock to your 101 years old. Rapper's Delight comes out. Here's where the culture splits. One part of the culture went corporate. That's Rapper's Delight, Sugar Hill Records. Uh, a, a young intern at Sugar Hill Records named Russell Simmons would leave Sugar Hill and start Def Jam. That would start corporate hip hop for the rest of our lives. Those that were true to Cool Herc, Africa Bambada, Grandmaster Flash, stayed cultural. We got labeled underground. In that, when it split in 79, Everybody started chasing the money. Money was coming in, and we was broke and poor. Like I said, 25 cent was too much. Now here comes record labels. First it was the independents. Little guys coming in trying to hustle, make a little dollar here and there. Some made some records, but nothing like rappers. When Rappers the Light jumped off, major independents started coming in the hood and looking around for who could rap. The first guys they came to was Cold Crush, Treacherous Three, all the Sugar Hill label. That lit, all of those groups said, Africa Bambada already told us that y'all were coming. We're keeping this culture to ourselves. We're gonna build our own labels, we're gonna do our own thing, y'all can go ahead. This was Africa Bambada telling us, we're gonna get big and when we do, we can't sell out. First thing dudes did when they got big, <laughs> sold completely out. And let me say this, and let me use this word correctly. 
It's not a sellout. I want you to really see the times we're living in. We're broke and starving. I mean, literally, the poverty is incredible, okay? Our parents are struggling. Everybody's struggling. And all you doing is rapping. Yeah, I'm this, I'm that, I'm da 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 da. And some dude comes along and says, listen, I got $20,000 for every verse. You, every 16 bars you kick, you rhyme. I'll give you $20,000. By the end of your album, you'll get about $300,000. And you know you have to pay some lawyer fees and stuff. But you may walk away with about two hundred twenty, dollars you know, something like that. This is not, and you got $20, and you got, you got $2 in your pocket. And somebody's saying, for the thing you did for free, I'm gonna give you a quarter of a million dollars for. The first hip hoppers refused it. Said, nope, we holding on to this. This is our thing, we, we doing this. This is when the movie Wild Style came out in 82. And they was showing you dudes organizing, Beach Street came out, dudes organizing. Harry Belafonte was like documenting hip hop. We knew what it was then. Actually, in 81, uh, uh, a friend of mine, I have to say a friend, because he is, but uh, a guy by the name of Curtis Blow uh, was the first one to sign to Mercury Records, 1981. Put out a record called These Are The Breaks. Funny how culture works. These are the breaks, and that is when hip hop broke. Curtis Blow, who is one of the biggest artists of our time on the street, when he signed to Mercury, the floodgates were open. He signed the Mercury and these are the break. And it, the record blew up. So everybody, Mercury was assigning people, then other little labels came along and they wouldn't come to Africa Bambada. They wouldn't come to Cool Heart. They, they wouldn't come to Flash and Melly Mel. I didn't even get into Melly Mel. Uh, Keith Cowboy uh, from the Furious Five. Where you get say ho, that comes from Keith Cowboy. Like a dude made that up. I didn't even get into them. All of them refused to sign with the mainstream. Curtis Blow signed. When he signed, a lot of other dudes said, well, we have to sign now because he's going to represent all of hip hop to all of America. So other dudes started signing with their own take on hip hop. We going to keep it real for Cool Herc. We going to keep it real with this cash. Oh, we gonna get these girls. Oh, I'm gonna buy this big house. Everybody had their vision of what hip hop was supposed to be because the mainstream came in and started giving power to worthless people. Mm -hmm. The community had people in it that, and I say worth, there's no such thing as a worthless person, but understand what I'm saying here. Some of us actually had the talent and others of us did not. The record companies came in and paid the ones that didn't have the talent. Because the ones that did would not give it to them. So they paid the ones that didn't have the talent but was willing to mimic and imitate the originals. This is why, with all due respect, Jam Master J, you know I love you, Run DMC, they, pad, they got everything from Cold Crush. They'll tell you, that's why I'm saying it here, with, with respect. They watched the Cold Crush but Russell signed them, not the Cold Crush. You know, so so the guy, so they doing these routines, and there's real dudes in the hood that's making these routines up and got hood credibility. But the mainstream don't care about them. They just want anybody who will mimic them for commercial means, like no no culture on it, no principles on it, nothing. Just come on and make this money. We're all broken, we're starving, so mad people went in to get the money. It worked. Hip hop became rich. Uh, and I mean rich, not wealthy. Wealthy has more to do with well-being, health, which includes money and resources. I'm just talking about money and resources. No, he no health, no principles, nothing. It's about 1983, Run DMC is now out, huge, huge rap group. Bigger than anybody today, Jay-Z, again, with much respect to him, he's nowhere near what Run DMC was. Nowhere near it. He got his lane, he's doing his thing. 
No doubt, Lil Wayne, all of them, they all got their lane. But if you can imagine a time when rap music did not exist in the world, and the first dudes to step up and spit they rhyme, and for the first time, America's hearing it, Germany's hearing it, Africa's hearing it. In fact, the only reason hip hop is in the world is because of Africa Bambada. He was the first guy in 82 to tour the world. Thank God for that. <laughs> Zulu Nation toured the world in 82. They put a record out called Planet Rock. And Planet Rock took them around the globe and everywhere they went, they set up chapters. And, and to this day, there's Zulu Nation chapters all over the world teaching real hip hop. This is how the culture stayed intact. Because Bam went around teaching it, telling the Chinese, telling the Japanese, telling the Koreans, telling the Nigerians, Zulu, South Africans, Australians, all of that. He's telling everybody, this is hip hop, breaking and seeing graffiti or DJing. And why do we do it? For peace, love, unity, and safely having fun. Now let's get the battle started. And dudes would just come out and give their soul. Now that soul got captured on a contract. And when you are selling your art, you're selling your soul. Let's make no mistake about it. Artists have to sell their art to live and eat. So be very careful where you sell portions of your soul. Be careful. The soul is infinite. The soul is infinite. You have a lot of soul to give. But the soul has rules. And the rule of the soul is, whatever the soul touches, touches it. So whatever you sell your soul to, make sure you want to touch it. Make sure you want that as part of your life. Life, not your month, your week, your day, your life. Many of us looked at it this way from the early days. Early days. We stay on oh, my breed of hip hop uh, is from Cool Herc, Africa Bambada, Grandmaster Flash. This is the line that I come from. When I came out with my first record, I followed the rules. Cultural rules. What's the cultural rules? Whenever you come out with your first rhyme, you shout the ancestors. <coughs> But you don't even speak before you shout the ancestors. We used to have a, a thing back in the days, I don't know if y'all familiar with Old English 800, but it's a malt liquor trick. We used to take the Old English 800, pour it out, before you even put it to your mouth, before you put the Heineken, before anything. Pour it out for my dudes that ain't here. This is what the record companies took away. Dudes is always talking about, yo, we got the crystal, we got the this and the that, the, the, the Patron and this and that. They never talk about pouring none out for their dudes. They drinking it all for themselves. <laughs> never once do you say, yeah, I got the Patron, but this goes out for my dude right here. Now let me start. These were cultural rules that we had that protected you from corporate life. Africa Bambada then, I'm speeding up, 1987. Africa Bambada has a meeting at Latin Quarters. He put all the top rappers together. By this time, we all had now put out records. We're battling now. It's all a battle now, because now corporate hip hop or corporate rap is trying to take over the image of cultural hip hop. This is back in like 84, 85. It's getting real comical. Hip hop is getting real comical. And the streets is like, where's the real, where's us? Where we at? And our representation looks real comical. Africa Bambada had a meeting in 87 and he said, we need to organize and unionize hip hop. We need to come together and make ourselves a global culture. 1987 he said that. I took his cue from there. And it was, actually, I remember talking to Heavy D, rest in peace. Heavy D was at the meeting as well. And he came through and I was like, yo, here's what we need to do. Stop the violence movement. 
1985, Ronald Reagan and Oliver North brought crack cocaine into Los Angeles to pay for their war uh, in South America. And that crack epidemic came to New York in 85. It got hit here in 83, 82. Came to us in 85. Crack epidemic was ridiculous. I ain't gotta tell y'all. <laughs> New York came. Artists like myself started to make records against the crack scene. But the crack seen the, the, the suppliers of crack cocaine were also the record companies themselves. We didn't know that MCA was, was part of Seagram's and Gin. Got caught up in money laundering scandals and all that type of stuff. We didn't know that. We didn't know RCA made warheads. You know, we're rapping for RCA and they're taking our money and making warheads to bomb Iraq or whoever. We didn't know. We just jumped in. Why? Because we're fighting each other. Why? Because we divided ourselves. Why? Because we were desperate and broke. Why? Because we had no parents. Why? Because they had no parents. Why? Because we were terrorized. Why? Because we were rich. Only rich people can be turned poor. Always remember that. Mm -hmm. Only rich people can be turned poor. Why? No human being on the earth is poor. Why are there groups of poverty people? Why are people in poverty? Why? This is a design. And a lot of us play games with it. A lot of intellectuals play games with it. Street dudes don't play games with this. But a lot of intellectuals play games when we write books, we do this and that and that. But at the end of the day, the problem still remains. What's the problem? White racism, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Even white people are affected. Big up to all the abolitionists that fought for my freedom, the early part of this country. White people helping Harriet Tubman on the Underground Railroad, run that word again, underground. What was above ground? Free blacks? <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it? Underground Railroad, underground because he, he, he wasn't supposed to see it. It was secret. We get this image of Harriet Tubman in the dark with the lantern. No, it was white families all along the trail. Blacks didn't own those homes. We were slaves running. Of course, there were some free blacks. Of course, it were part of the abolitionist movement. Many free blacks and free blacks were part of that. But they're fighting for their own freedom. We're fighting for our own freedom. What does it mean for another race of people to fight for your freedom? That's real black history. We could talk all day about our own history. Sure, we should know it by now. But what about the white folk that gave up their lives, was lynched right along with the black people for black freedom? What about that? See, this is also part of the hip-hop discussion because when you start to talk about revolution, changing society, well, racism is not going anywhere until we get rid of race. As long as we keep seeing ourselves as racist, then there will be racism. This is where hip-hop comes in, and a lot of people, I mean, I get real controversial. I don't even know why, but it's called controversial because I suggested hip-hop is a global culture. And we are, I, I don't know why anybody can't see that, but we are a global culture and we're moving into the realm of spirituality as well. Something I'd like to leave you with here today. I discussed the history of hip hop up to the point of say, I came out in, I came out in 86. It'll stop right in 85. With the crack cocaine scene and those who represent culture and those who represent corporate. Those that represented corporate didn't care. They, they, they rhymed about crack, they sold crack, they was part of it, they was part of the destruction of the community itself. But I will say in their defense, the people they destroyed were already destroying themselves. Those who had sense in their head would walk past the crack dealer like, you stupid. And, 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 and the crack dealer would respect that. Any kid in the hood with a father, dealers would respect that. Any kid in the hood whose moms was somebody in, in the neighborhood, the dealers would respect that. Nobody was just running around, just selling crack to babies. No, that never happened. 
What happened was it was a systematic ethnic cleansing of the African American and Latino community. Systematic ethnic cleansing in the United States. Those that were smart stayed away from it. That's it. Others, oh, let me try that, man. I said, there you go. Now, I stop here because now we'll jump to the metaphysical part of this. And this is where you've got to really expand your mind, taking everything I just said culturally. No jobs. We're brilliant in terms of academics, we think. We're intellectuals, critical thinkers at that. But no one cares in the society. So much for education, so much for intellect, so much for awareness. And you should think about this. It doesn't matter how much you know. If the environment in which you live is trying to reject you, that's the issue. This is the issue. And this is what happened. Mainstream rejected us. Because our parents, were, some of our parents, were trained by the mainstream, they rejected us too. Sad to say, not everybody. MC Light has brilliant parents. Queen Latifah has brilliant parents. Their mothers, you know, Lauren Hill, mom's always with her. But the majority. When hip hop was coming up, don't touch my turntable, you gonna scratch my record. Turn that noise off. Some of the greatest MCs rhyming in a bathroom, they father kicking the door. Did you do your homework? Homework? I'm spitting the next ticket out the ghetto. And you telling me about homework. This is what we were up against in, in, in these days. I bring this because now the metaphysical. Or should I say, well, metatophysica. Beyond the physics, beyond the physics, beyond physical. And that's what it is today. In Aristotle's time, it was beyond the physics. He had 13 books on natural science. And because this last book had no title, they named it the after physics. Ta meta ta physica. Metaphysics, the after physics, after Aristotle's 13 books on natural science, physics. What and metaphysics has now become is a, a science that includes a whole host of mind sciences. Uh, and I mentioned that just to put a disclaimer at the top, the type of metaphysics I study uh, would be called metu Uh It is not um, Western metaphysics. It is not um, even, uh, metu comes from the Egyptians, actually, uh, uh, an Egyptian system of spirituality that deals with words, deals with, with, with divine speech. Uh, and the reason I even look at that and say, well, it's not even that, is because my perspective is hip-hop. And what I've realized is that hip-hop is African-American enlightenment. And a lot of, Af it's really human enlightenment, but Specifically for African Americans, it's African American enlightenment. Meaning that first let's talk about this called uh, intuit knowing. I-N-T-U-I-T. -I intuit knowing. Intuit knowing. This is the knowledge you was born with. This is, some people call it genetic memory. This is the knowledge you was born with. This is the knowledge that nature hands you at the time of your birth. This is the knowledge that colonialism is trying to take from you. Understand the game. The game is you are born perfect, but you enter a system that makes you imperfect through to, uh, due to your perception of yourself. Meaning you're born perfect, but you don't see yourself in any perfected state in any part of your environment perfection and beauty and strength and courage is always the image of the one oppressing you you are never the symbol of beauty intellect courage knowledge no you're never that what you have to do is put yourself aside and 
assimilate to a make-believe white mainstream reality, white people included. Some people call this white supremacy, that's incorrect. It's just called white racism. Because white supremacy, there's no, usually when you say white supremacy, you think white people above other races or using that as a, um, a reason for lynchings and beatings and kidnappings and burnings. When you think white supremacy, you think violence, you think the Ku Klux Klan, you think that. But the question for real intellectuals is, how is that supreme? The, the term is incorrect, white supremacy. No, white supremacy is love, justice, knowledge, mercy, compassion. That is white supremacy. To be a supreme anything, you cannot be against nature. To be a supreme anything, the more in harmony you are with the universe, the more supreme you become. So white supremacy outside of the laws of nature is just white racism. You want to meet a real white supremacist. <laughs> you want a white supremacist as your friend. And I must admit, even though they will not admit this of themselves, but I've met some white supremacists in my day, real ones, people, real white people that treat me better than I treat myself, love me more than I love myself, care for me more than I can care for myself or care for myself. Someone who says, no, don't go there, there's a snake around the corner. That's white supremacy. Black mother with two kids acting stupid. White man comes along, you better listen to your mother. She's the queen of the earth. White supremacy. You want a white supremacist as a friend. Why do I bring this up? Because this is how education keeps us mentally enslaved. The words we use, the images that these words give our minds, is what's controlling your perception. What is perception? The way you see things, the way you see reality. If a painter was to walk in this room right now, the painter would see all kinds of stuff. This needs to be touched up. Oh, that's gonna fade in a couple of months. Uh, that paint is called something blue. This paint is called something... We don't know any of this. If the, pl if, if the painter stayed in the room and a plumber walked in the same room, the room would change again. The plumber would say, oh no, forget the paint. Look, this fixture here, we need to fix that sprinkler. Look, this, uh, there's a pipe behind here that goes to there, and that's where we're gonna get the main. This is invisible to you. Okay, the painter, the plumber is in the room, now an electrician walks in the room. Suddenly the lighting thing. Now, these are three different people seeing the same room with three different awarenesses. It's the same room, but based on your knowledge, reality itself presents itself to you based on what you know. If you don't have a word for something, you overlook it. You only see according to your vocabulary. There's things in this room right now that we just, it goes totally unnoticed because we don't have a word for them. There's things going through your body right now, invisible, and you just don't know about it because you don't have a word for it. The more words you know, the better equipped you are to handle reality. Now let's go deeper, if you could swallow that piece. <laughs> Perception is based on your knowledge. What is knowledge? Knowledge is awareness. Education is not knowledge. Education is training. We need to be educated in some things. I'm educated in MC. I'm educated to that. I'm trained to that. But that's not knowledge. Knowledge is awareness. What do you know? What, what, what do you see? 
The only way you could see is with a collection of words. Or so you believe. Ah, let's go deep. <laughs> words create reality. The more words I see, the more reality I can see. But this is how white racism gets us every time, through words. Words are not reality. Words are symbols of reality. A word, what is a bird? B-I-R-D. What is a B, first of all? A symbol. What is an I? That line up. And why do we call it an I? What? Why not call it a dot? A B I R. What is R? R. Why do I have to say that? R. Bird. D. D. Analyze every piece of sound that comes out of your mouth and you'll break up white racism. That's why I'm telling it to you. This is a technique. Bird. That's not what that thing is. That's what you've been educated to call it. You're not hearing it. You're not hearing it. Come on, let me say it again. B-I-R-D is not what is floating through air. And look at the words, I can't even speak anymore, look. B-I-R-D is, what is is? <laughs> not, what is not? Why do I say, why am I speaking like this? Once you can get past English language, you get past English racism. We can't get past English racism because we're speaking English. And the English language words are creating the reality in which we are seeing. This is why when you speak slang language, it upsets white racism. You have taken, you have taken that word that they say, oh, what is that thing doing? It is flying. What is fly flying? Flying. What is that? Like, what is that? What exactly is it? Flying. Something going through the air, I guess, without a pole to hold it up. Flying. Why can't we call that God? Hmm. <laughs> Why can't you see something flying through the air and you say, oh, somebody said, what is that? That's God. Okay, now so, what is that flying through the air like that? Oh, that's my ancestors. Why do I say this? Because no one knows what's flying through the air. No one knows what that is. But in a culture, you have to give meaning to every material item in your world, you won't see it. So for English, it's called bird, B-I-R-D. So that's what we agree to call that. But that ain't what it is. Those that are into true spirituality think on this other side. If you know this, people don't want to say they don't want to admit it, but you can check the history books on this one. Most of the spiritual teachers of history, Jesus, Buddha, Moses, these people, not, not Moses, Jesus, Buddha, <laughs> Krishna, they were illiterate. Go back and do the history. Jesus couldn't read. <laughs> yes. Buddha couldn't read. Krishna couldn't read. They were illiterate could not count. These people were not interested in English systems. In fact, their civilization is before it. 
When you don't know how to read or write, you see God. And let me say it this way. When you can look past the symbols of reality and see reality, you see God. You see the activities of God. The reason we have so many atheists in this world today is because they're speaking English. <laughs> they're speaking English. If you could see a reality, I'll give you another, here's another example. This is, this is what the mystery systems used to teach. This is what you had to know before you even got in. What is this? I was trained to call it a microphone. Microphone. What is microphone? What, what is this? Podium. Pod. What is a pod? Podium. <laughs> this is how hip hop started, right here, on the spiritual level, on the mental level, changing reality. What is this? Podium. No, it's not. <laughs> That's what the English call it. What do you call it? This is how hip hop started, just like this. We started renaming everything in the society that was around us. They told us to dance by holding your partner and dance like this. We said, no, we're going to fling her up in the air and bring her back. And, ah! <laughs> they said, this is art. Leonardo and you know, all these artists, are Cezanne and this one and that one. Michelangelo, these are the, the premier artists. We said they're corny. This is what we need over here. Dude on the side of the train. Everything they said had value, we rejected it. And that's how hip hop started. The language they gave us, we flipped it. They said dope means stupid or drug. We said dope is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> fresh was supposed to be you talking back to your parents or fresh fruit, something fresh. We was like, no, fresh is applied to us. We fresh. The fruit is right. <laughs> you know, so this is the consciousness that we dealt with intuitively. We didn't know we were doing this, but we were doing it. What we were doing was getting beyond English interpretation of reality and creating our own reality. And we started with words like chill and chill out. America loved that. When they first heard chill and chill out, that was all. Everybody said, yeah, we got to chill. That's all from hip hop. Most of American society today, most of American culture, I tell you this with all due respect, one of the only things the world like about America is hip hop. Remember that when you're traveling abroad and want to dress like some corporate dude at Wall Street, the world don't respect that. I travel everywhere, that's why I'm saying it to you. When you get off planes and bikes, I take ships, I don't fly, but when you get out in the port, Dudes is hip hop. The dudes are handling your bags, hip hop. The, the police, hip hop. The people that's checking you in, hip hop. And I'm not talking about, oh, they like rap music. These are B girls, B boys. You, you walk in, they say, yo, are they checking you in to the hotel? They say, I'm gonna be at the B girl convention this weekend. Are you gonna be there? Yeah, I'm gonna be there. And she's all dressed up tight and all this, you know, like in her corporate look. The world is exploiting and enjoying hip hop way more than America is. Way more, way more. Most rap artists and DJs make most of their money out of the country. Nobody's here in America. Nobody's here, everybody's in Africa now. Africa is exploding, exploding. That's why the Chinese went over there. Because as big as China is, they still ain't bigger than Africa. Could you imagine that? As big as China is, Africa swallows that up in, in, in resources, in regenerative resources, diamonds, gold, silver, copper. Their cell phones got some new mineral in it that makes the cell phone work. That come out of Africa. Everything, Africa's exploding. 
and hip hop also in Africa is exploding. You know where else is exploding? South Pacific, Australia, Fiji Islands, New Zealand, Thailand. These places got money and they're spending it on hip hop. You better hear what I'm saying to you in this college right here. When you get your, your receipt, I mean your degree. <laughs> When you get your degree and um, you're now looking for employment with, with, with that degree, don't buy the myth that your degree is worthless or doesn't get you a job, but that's a myth. College degrees are respected all over the world. People respect knowledge. But what we, what we have is Americans depending on their college education, and that's never what a college education was, was supposed to do. College education is supposed to prepare, prepare you for the world, not give you the world. It's supposed to prepare you for the world. So if you in here playing games, when it comes, when the, when, when the day comes, and you say, well, damn, I got this degree and I don't know what to do, and da 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 This was your time to plan your future. And I'm adding to that planning by saying to you, hip hop is no longer an entertainment pastime. Let me tell you, you can raise families on this, send kids to college on this. You can pay your own way through college. Hip hop can relieve your college debt if you play your cards right. Become an MC immediately. I don't even care if you like rap. Become an MC any age. Become a DJ. DJ's even easier to be. Play other people's music. You get $10,000 for 45 minutes. Can't beat that. This is, these are the new jobs. These are the, this is new employment in this country and in the world. Every, the, the, the economy, the world economy has gone uh, entrepreneur. No one is working for anyone else anymore. Those are, well, of course they are. <laughs> Trade is still going on. But what the world is marching toward is entrepreneurships. Uh, more people working for themselves, more people creating their ideas and selling them to the public. And I kind of think it's brilliant, to be honest with you, but what's going to happen also is those without ideas are going to find themselves homeless and at the poverty level. Those that are not creative now, uh, you know, the, 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 the dude that could just crunch numbers or, you know, good at math or this kind of thing. It, it, it may come in handy in terms of organizational skills or, or intellectual skills, but in, really, if you can't make something with your hands, if you can't express yourself in some kind of tangible way, you'll be at a loss in the future. This is just a message from hip hop coming at you. This is what I tell my own kids as well, that there are no uh, um, good paying jobs for intellectuals. There really are not. A CD called The Flattening of, of America. Uh, you, should look, you should get to that. Uh, it, was, it was early 2000, The Flattening of America. And, and it talks about how there are, there are no more hierarchies. There's no more superstardom and this one's on top and that one's on the bottom. Everything's flat. Everything now is flat, and you notice this in music, meaning like any of you can really compete with me in, in, in the music market right now. It doesn't matter that I'm probably, I have 20 albums ahead of you or that I've been rapping for 30 years, and none of that matters. Today what matters is if you put out a song today, you can compete with uh, an artist who's been in the industry for 10, 20 years. I can put a record out and compete with um, you know, U2 or Metallica or uh, you know, a a everyone is on the same level. Uh, this is what America wanted. It was called equality. Uh, everyone on the same level. But this is also now becoming an issue because if you're not a creative spirit, it's gonna be difficult. Now, let me go back to something real quick. We have some new people that actually came in. Wow, you guys. <laughs> Should I rewind and I go, uh, you know? But uh, we, we, we were talking um, more on the metaphysical side. This is about how to think, how to think your way out of the situation you're about to get 
are hit with. And this is what I want to leave you with. Number one, hip hop is no longer an entertainment pastime. Don't treat it like that anymore. Treat it like as a side investment that you're gonna play, make of yourself. If you're a dancer, learn how to dance, break, learn how to break, pop, lock, uh, up rock, spin on your head. People around the world are paying top dollar to see anybody, not a star, not, not anybody that can do the hip hop elements masterfully will have a lifetime source of employment. If you master DJ, let's say you're a 50 year old Irish woman that teaches math in Brooklyn. I just made that up. 50 year old Irish woman teaching math in Brooklyn. She's got to subsidize, she, she, she supplement her salary. She's off in the summer and she got to find something to do. She should become a DJ. 50 year old Irish woman teaching math in Brooklyn starts throwing on MOP, mix that with Wu Tang, come back to most depth and start mixing records. Put herself like today you have the internet, put herself out there like that and say, look, I'm DJ Irish math teacher. <laughs> And this is how we gonna get down. She grabs her mic and says, this is for my students in the fifth grade. Let's get it popping. And starts throwing on music. Guaranteed, listen to this. Guaranteed. She's gonna make more money over the summer than her entire salary for the year. Hear me today. Hear this. The DJs are making 10,000 for 45 minutes. MCs are making 25,000, minimum, I'm talking minimums. 25,000, 50 minute show. If you play for Rock the Bells, the lowest is 20,000. And them shows be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and 20 minutes, 20, people up there, 20, 15 minutes, they made $45,000. This is what I'm saying. And as we all are looking for new employment, looking for new jobs, looking, and even older people who are looking for retirement, looking for that social security, hip hop is the ultimate way to go. But you have to be serious about the elements like anything else. Once you are good at it, people start paying you for it. Once you master any of the elements, breaking, MCing, graffiti art, DJing, even beatboxing. I keep leaving beatboxing out because it's part of MCing. But the core elements is breaking, MCing, graffiti art, DJing. If you could do any of that, you have lifetime employment at any age, any ethnicity, race, religion. Hip hop is not into none of that. Racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, all that. Hip hop is above that, really. You go in the world, present yourself the way you are. And this is my next point about consciousness. When you look in the mirror, how do you feel about yourself? This is hip hop. Back in the day, somebody would come over and say, yo, what's your name? Um, Bob. Okay, Bob, you go ahead and stand over there. Somebody come over here, what's your name? Super Bob Ski from 123, look at me. Oh. <laughs> Super Bob Ski from 123, look at me. He's already coming out the game with value. Listen to what I'm saying here. Value is not based on what you own or what you have. In fact, I'll drop this jewel on you real quick. Real value is based on what you can do without. It's, it's not about what you can accumulate. It's how functionable are you with nothing. And we can't function on nothing, so that becomes the scale. How low can you go? How deep can you go? Because after a while, if you really become a spiritual being, you don't rely on the world for nothing. Nothing. You enter the world, but you are not dependent upon the world. You're dependent upon invisible forces. 
What are the invisible forces? Love. People can't see love. They're too busy watching hate. It's all about your perception. If you see love, you see love. I'll say it again. If you see love, if you can see it, this is love right here. <laughs> I'm seeing love. She in her own mind may believe I'm not love. <laughs> love is bigger than me. I'm just whoever I am. No, that's in her head. She's only a dream character in my perception. She could be God for all I know. We don't know who anybody is, so why can't she be God? We don't know where God is, when God is, how God is, so why she can't be God? This woman right here, I choose with my perception to see her as God. This is an ancient African technique. God was never outside of your perception. God was never outside of what you thought. That's why Western man came and said, there is no God, they're just making it up. Right! <laughs> but God is the greatest human invention in human history. And the reason being, the reason Africans created God is so that humanity in its infinity would never run out of something to rise to. This is why God exists. If you don't have God, you don't rise. There is nothing human about technology. Sorry. Nothing human about it. And this is what I want to say in terms of your spirit. What can you see? This is God to me. And I respect her and will treat her just like that. That's my perception of her. <clears throat> now she can do something to break that perception. She could do something to enhance it. Mm. What if she knew that I thought she was God? There'd be something in her that would try to live up to the image that I see of her. There'd be something in her that when she approached me, she would at least have to either deny God or become. This is how as a community we treated each other. If there is no God, then we are not family. The only way we can be brothers or sisters is if we have the same parent. Think. We cannot call ourselves brothers or sisters if we don't have the same mother or father. When God is the eternal mother, we become all brothers and sisters. When we all say, yes, I am part of this idea called God, not a man in the sky, not even a metaphor, not even a spirit in a, a, a separate consciousness. No, 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 we don't have to get there yet. Let's just make God up right now, like our ancestors did. They never, nobody told them what God was. What God was, was your dead father. What God was, was your, your deceased mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, ancestor, builder of the tribe. This was the God. And when we got rid of the God, we stopped worshiping that God and started worshiping their God, we lost our spiritual power. No one wants to admit it, but your parents are your gods. Whether they're crazy, deranged, <laughs> it doesn't matter. They come before you in the hierarchy of life. Nature doesn't care what you think about your parents. Nature is following laws, order. When you're out of the order, when you're out of order, you can't work. What, for, what places us out of order first is the speaking of English and relying on English language to define our reality. Speak slang. 
It means they change every word you can to something else that means something you represent. Never let English language define your reality. That's number one. Number two, what do you think of yourself when you say your own name? My mother named me Lawrence Parker. Guess my name? Lawrence Parker. The minute I got a chance, I got out, I said, I'm an MC. I changed my name. I am now knowledge reigning supreme over nearly everyone. Imagine saying that for the first time. I got a weird reaction, but I changed my reality by changing my name. When I changed my name, I changed my reality. Listen to me. This is going to change. This is it. How is it possible? How is it possible that I can make a record called Sound of the Police and the police are jamming to the record? <laughs> How is that possible? It's possible because we're not dealing with just words and meaning and we're dealing with culture. We're dealing with culture. A lot of police officers agree. They say, this is crazy. This job I'm working right now, a lot of cops don't even work. They're like teachers. They get about the same salary. Public servants. I bring the cops up here because this is the beginning of peace in the hood right here. And this is going to sound real corny. But there used to be a time when the police officer used to walk the beat. What, 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 well, he used to walk around the block, actually, patrolling. And as he walked around the block, certain business owners would give the police officer stuff. Apple here, uh, something for the kid there, this kind of thing. And what that was, was a, it lowered corruption in the hood. The same thing was done to the teachers, but I'm going to stay here on the cops. Certain neighborhoods took care of their police officers. So the police officers took care of them. In our neighborhoods, we don't take care of the police officers, so they don't take care of us. You are the power, not them. If you would treat the police with respect, they would treat you with respect. I know that sounds crazy coming from me. <laughs> I know it's crazy. I have, to, I have to look at myself <laughs> insane, but I, the truth must come out. Truth. Any human being will treat you the way you treat them. Forget cop. That's what we're looking at. They seeing us as Trayvon. The hoodie, oh yeah. No, look past that. If you look past that, look past the English language, look past the imagery, look past your education, look past all that, and see a human being. See a person just like yourself trying to make it. The police are not the problem. We are. We're the problem. We outnumber the police like a hundred to one. A thousand to one. Why are the police still shooting us down in the hood? Because they're afraid. What makes them afraid? We make them afraid. We have no respect for the police, and they know it. So at the end of the day, what are they the first thing you hear? No respect for us. But the onus, the responsibility is not on the police. The responsibility is on us. We are the power. We are the superiors here. The police are supposed to protect us. And they're only supposed to protect those that need protection. Another group of us don't even need to see you. We'll take care of ourselves. But those that need protection, that's where the cops should be. Now, if you walked up to a cop and said, listen, this ain't a bribe or nothing, man, but here's some money for gas. Here's, not cash, a, a card. Here's a card, in a, in a, you know, like a Christmas gift. Yo, here's some money for cash. I know it's crazy, but here, he may even reject it. But I guarantee he's going to tell his wife about it that night. Yo, I was patrolling the other day. Dude walked up to me trying to give me $50 as a Christmas gift. I, I turned it down, but it was, it was a good gesture. 
change his mind totally about who he's looking at. How many times do our business owners, they diss the cops. Business owners be dissing cops. That's why cops don't even go into the cops only go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> no real talk. Police, they feel intimidated. They walk inside certain stores. People looking at them. What you doing? Yo, you got the uniform on. You walking around. Cops are getting intimidated too. But what if the police existed in, a, in an environment where they were supported? Where not snitching, to ratting your brother out. No, not that. But living in a society where there's no need, there's no crime. There's no crime. Why is there no crime? Because there's order. Law with no order equals crime. Remember that. Law with no order equals crime. That's how crime is created. You have laws, but no order. So everybody's breaking the law. See, if you have order, you don't break laws. Gravity is an order. You don't break that law. Breathing is an order. There's an exercise where, oh, we could say this. Rock star energy drink. Wow, I just put that in history. <laughs> See how quick history come up right there? Rock star energy drink. Those who want to um, do the exercise, we're going to say rock star to ourselves without opening our mouths, without saying anything outside. We're going to say this to ourselves. We're going to say rock star to ourselves. Don't say it out loud at the count of three. One, two, three. Okay. Now the question to ask, if you've said rock star in, in your mind, the question to ask is, what voice is that? What voice is that? What, what voice just spoke? You just said rock star without moving your mouth at all. On top of that, you, you, on top of saying rock star, you heard yourself say rock star. Uh, how can you hear yourself say rock star and no vibration of sound has happened? See, this puts a different perspective on what sound actually is. And, and what memory is. Memory's not in the brain, memory's in the soul. The only thing you take with you after this life is your memories or your knowledge, your experiences. That's the only thing you take. Unless you study Egypt uh, uh, culture, they believe you can take all their stuff with you on the other side. <laughs> Just as a, a side note. But if you said, rock star in your mind or in your being is the true answer, is the true statement. In your being, what was that voice? What was the voice that spoke and then you heard yourself speaking? But these ears did not hear you say anything because your mouth didn't move. So the ears didn't hear it, the mouth did not move, but you spoke and you heard yourself speaking. If you close your eyes, you can see this better. If you close your eyes and put this image in another site, if you close your eyes, you can still see this. What is the sight that can see your future? These two eyes don't see the future. These two eyes don't see the past. Yet, you can see your past and you can see your future. You can actually see your past. <laughs> what is the sight that can see beyond time? Hmm. <laughs> Don't give it away. <laughs> what is this is this is an ancient meditation. This is an ancient meditation that I am not the flesh. I am the energy, the consciousness, the being in the flesh. And this is proof. This is no fade. This is not 
Religion, this is actual fact. You can speak without moving your mouth. You can hear without ears. You can see without eyes. So what happens when these eyes, this mouth, and this ear drops off into the grave? These other senses are all you're left with. Death is an illusion. Once you realize this, you live your life more courageously. Now, no one wants to die before their time, so you try to protect yourself. But know that this body is the limitation of you. It is not your zenith. It is not your ultimate. Your ultimate is that voice that just said rock star. <laughs> That voice that just said rock star without nothing physical moving, that person is immortal. That person is not here with you. Let's go deeper. The body is in, what is it, three dimensions, right? Forward, back, right, left, up, down, and time. Fourth dimension. Three dimensions plus time. That's our physical reality. Front, back, right, left, up, down, that's 3D plus time. What happened to in and out? Look at the East, look at the, the English thought. Back, forth, right, left, up, down, no in and out. No in and out. What is in and out? Rock star. <laughs> Rock star says, I exist without the body. So where is this other existence? Where is it? It's not here. It's not in three-dimensional space where you really are. The person that said this is in a whole different dimension. Just switch a little bit. Talk to yourself more. <laughs> Affirm to yourself more. Don't move none of it. Mm, no, close this down and go within and say, I am the greatest dot, dot, dot ever. I have all my needs coming with speed. I am a being of love and light and knowledge. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Whatever it is, have your affirmation on your tongue or, sorry, in your being. This is how the gods created this whole reality. The first humans, imagine, the first humans, they came from inner space. They came out, study the Anunnaki's. They came out of inner space. Not from up, outer space, inner space, rock star, <laughs> before, there was a body, there was this voice traveling in this voice's dimension. To get here to the earth, the inner voice created this outer extension of itself to be in this dimension. Once you realize that you are not just in this dimension, but you're also in another dimension, you now are free. Because whatever happens to you here in this dimension is not your only reality. See, this is how Jesus was able to get beaten and, and brutalized and hang on the cross. He wasn't here. He was the rock star. Inside he went to the inner man. Do what you want with the body. I'm not here. Now once you realize that level of consciousness, where you are officially, you identify yourself as the spirit, not the flesh. You are the inner voice, not the outer voice. Once you become the inner voice, now your outer voice has power. Now when you speak, it's not just a shell speaking. There's a being speaking through the shell. And this is where you heal all sickness in your body. This is where you command reality to work with you and it works according to your consciousness. Why? Because it's not a shell that's speaking. There's a real being in the shell that is speaking. And when the real being speaks, 
All nature and the universe responds. This is how hip hop was created. We spoke it into existence. That's why I'm seeing. This is why MCing is so important to hip hop. We spoke our reality into existence. The word MCing, E M C E E I N, did not exist. The correct term is master of ceremonies. We called ourselves MCs for Master of Ceremonies, M.C. Rakim came along and said, it's the E-M-C-E-E, -E -E, a repetition of words, check out my melody, we all switch. Now it became E-M-C-E-E, -E -E. we made that up. DJ, D-E-E-J-A-Y-I-N, we made that up. Breaking. We made that up. Graffiti art. We didn't make up graffiti. The act of writing on the side of the train. Graffiti is an Italian term, it means scratch or to scratch. We called ourselves writers, taggers, bombers. America called us graffiti artists. Bombers. But with each of these words, we created a new reality. This is how we're surviving. What is hip hop? It's like saying gaba ga. <laughs> what is gaba ga? I don't know, but let's create it. This is how you can defeat the cops on another level. You know, if you had a, a, a if, if you had a, a, a weapon that can dismantle firearms, there'd be no more police brutality. Because the, the only thing they got is the gun. Let's say even mace, you can get that. You deal with that. But a gun, somebody firing on you. If you had something called a GB, I mean, what's a GB? A GB is a little thing you turn on and it dismantles guns. Now go make it. <laughs> this is what you tell children. Because they will make it. They will come up with a thing called, this is a GB. What does it do? It dismantles guns. Look, clear, 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 whole police department. Done. This, is, this is how, this is the reverse of the use of words or, or your original tongue, as they said. The original word. You didn't wait for something to come. You, you said it first, then created it. It's not created, then you say it. <laughs> I'm giving you a mic. What is it, microphone? No. Let's first say gabba dabba. What is gabba dabba? Oh, it's a, it's a suit that I put on. And when I put this suit on, I can go into another dimension. I disappear from here. <coughs> Word? A gabba, yeah, it's called a gabba keeper. Yeah, gabba keeper, that's what it's called. Now go make it. Our children should be trained like this. There's a machine that you, there's a carpet that flies across the sky with no, no gasoline, nothing. It uses the sun and it flies across the sky. You're five years old. It's called a juju. Now go make it. <laughs> Little kids running around. Yo, we could do this. Yo. <laughs> and you want to hear something about invention. When you give little kids an impossible, a seemingly impossible task, they create other stuff along the way. They discover themselves along the way trying to get to the impossible task. This is again the purpose for God. The purpose for an infinite being in your mind is so that you never get tired of yourself. <laughs> that there's always something for you to reach for, always something for you to go, something always exciting. God is always one step ahead. But no, not if you're a scientist. <laughs> if you're a scientist, the universe is dead. It is a thing. It's not organic. It is something that its laws, once understood, can be controlled. And what's so interesting is this new science, or not new now, but this new talk on quantum mechanics or quantum physics. I'm going to end now. I'm going off. Um, 
but I'll say this about quantum mechanics, quantum physics, is that it's said, it's said in, in the quantum theory that if you look at an atom, it's fixed in one position. But if you turn your back on an atom, it's in superposition, meaning that atom, that the world of atoms, uh, the atomic structure of, of material reality, atoms are outside of space. Certain atoms can be in China and in America, and if you affect one, the, the minute you hit one, another one, the, the, the same thing you did to this one will happen to this one. They call it being co-located. This idea of atoms not being in fixed positions in space, meaning that if I'm not looking at an atom, it's everywhere. It's in superposition. It could be anything and be anywhere until I look at it. Once I look at it, the observer collapses the atomic structure and it becomes whatever my perception tells the atom to be. This is called sight. Everyone knows that sight is not out there. Sight is in here. Sight happens in the brain, which really happens in the mind. And so the reason I bring this to the reason I bring this up is because Quantum mechanics says that the observer is creating the reality that the observer observes. So scientists are saying the brain creates reality. That there's no reality out here. Reality is in here. This is what science says. Reality is in here. So if reality is in here and you're a racist, what kind of reality are you going to project? And project to yourself only. Look how fast God is. Way faster than scientists. God says, I'll play with you guys for a little longer. Y'all trying to figure out the universe through mathematics and all of that. Okay, here's how I'm going to do y'all. I'm going to show y'all quantum mechanics. Basically, I'm going to show you a mirror. They don't realize that the universe is alive. How can there be life in the universe and the universe itself not be? How can a dead thing create a live thing? The universe is alive and it thinks. We are it. We're it. Right, right now the universe is talking to itself having a conversation with itself right now for whatever purpose it wants to fulfill. So scientists trying to use Galileo's equations, mathematics is the, is the language of the universe, that's wrong. Galileo's wrong on that. What, was real, what is the real language of the universe is intention. This is what the universe is really looking at, intention. And we got that now through genetic sciences. I'm giving you these titles so when you leave, do the study, do the follow-up research. Genetics, the genome. People are realizing now that your environment is way more important than even your culture. That, you're, that the environment you're in, your genes are responding to the environments that you're in. Imagine that. That everything you do as a human, there's a tiny, 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 tiny little organism running around that does the exact same thing. And let me say it, let me, put, let me put it to you this way so you can really see it. You are only a collection of cells. You should really spell it as C-E-L-F. Cell. Because what the self is, is the consciousness of cells. Cells reproduce, <laughs> they talk, they have waste, they have a job and a function, every cell knows what it's supposed to do. These are little thinking beings, and when they unite, they make you. The way you think is what they are thinking. 
When you say I'm hungry, it's not you that's hungry, it's your cells that are hungry. You are the slave of your higher self, C-E-L-F. You are the servant of your higher self until you become your higher self, then you're free. This is why they say you are born a slave. You are, you're a slave to yourself. You're a slave to the addictions that your cells want. You're a slave to the made up realities of your language. You're a slave to your fears and this kind of thing. Once you realize that I am the eternal immortal being that speaks without this body, has existence without time and space, once you really know that, you start moving like that, and then reality starts playing with you. You start reading things right in the nick of time, some message coming to you right off the wall, nobody else see it. You're the only one to see it. Why? Because your perception is such. This is how you get over, this is how you get past, this is how you compete. Never compete is how you compete. The ancient way. This is the ancient, ancient way. You don't compete. That's, that's the English way. The way of nature is cooperation. Everything works in cooperation. That's why we African Americans are here in the United States today. I didn't talk much on black history, but here's little bees. <laughs> that's why we're here. I'll drop this little piece on you. There's a book called Slave Religion uh, by Robotol. Ro Ro Robotol. Uh, uh, I can't, R-O-B-O-T-E-A-U, R-O-B-O-T-E-A-U, it's called Slave Religion. In this book, this guy talks about how we got to the United States, which was a, over about four or five different migrations. First of all, Africans were already here in the United States. We were already here from like 50,000 years ago. We, we were first called Native Americans. We were called indigo. This is where you get the word Indian from. It's not from the word indigenous. It's from the word indigo. That was the, that was the color of the people that they first saw. The original human beings were, were blue black. Uh, it's, it's preserved in Hindu art. They have like Krishna in blue and all that. Uh, but now it's, it's, it's now more glamorized. But back in the days, humans were blue black. They were called indigo. And when these uh, Western explorers came to some of these islands, what they saw was dark, dark, really dark, dark-skinned people. And they called them indigos. That became Indians or Indo. You said Indo-European, Indonesian, Indo. That's all dealing with the color indigo because that's what the original black, so-called black man or woman, I have to say woman, what the original black woman was because geneticists now have realized that the entire history of humanity is in women, meaning that from the first, what they call African Eve, a genetic Eve, the first black woman to leave Africa and, and, and venture into Europe and other parts of Asia and, 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 and other parts of Africa, this one woman, they say she, we have all of her genes. We have, like most of humanity has all of her genes. And it's women that have passed these genes on through human history. Forget somebody writing history. Your history is already imprinted on your genetic structure and it's passed in humanity by women. So to disrespect a woman is literally to disrespect the whole history of humanity. Literally. To harm a woman is to actually harm the whole history of humanity, at least genetically. So I bring this little piece up because, come back to the indigo, come back to the Indian, come back to the fact that you were already here. The point I'm bringing up is this. You can escape White racism, white people included. Nobody wants racism, nobody. No rational human being is into that. That's why white folk fought for black independence. That's why there's an abolitionist movement. I talked about that earlier. That's why if we appeal to the humanity in each other, then all these racial divisions, of course, will disappear. 
But we also have to become brothers and sisters, which means we need a God. A God. Something that we agree is above us all. Some people make law their God. Some people make love their God. All of these are good, but a godless person is a slave. This is what a slave was. It was first Islam in Africa, Arabs, Arab Moors, they called them. Those tribes, they're the ones that are you today. Because the, what made you eligible for slavery was that you wasn't Muslim or Christian. First it was Islam that enslaved Africans. Then it was the Christians. Islam sold Africans to the Christians. Then the Christians took over with the Crusades. God wills it, and the Crusades started. And they defeated the Muslims and took the whole slave trade. But the ones they were enslaving was ones that were not Christian. At this point, if you, if you were Muslim, you were getting enslaved now. But in the beginning, if you, was, if you said Muslim, you said Christian, you were good. Those who were slaves were said, I'm not down with either one. I'm doing nature. I'm doing astronomy. I don't need to read. I don't need to write. I'm reading nature. These are the ones that were enslaved. These are the ones that made it to the United States. They talk all the time about Africans arriving in chains. That's a lie. Well, it's not a lie. Some did. Many did arrive in chains. But the history of Africans in this country is like, the way they tell it, is like telling, it's, it's like saying 200 years from now, you're telling the history of African Americans today. And you say, look at Rodney King. Take a look at the prison system. Now these people were enslaved, weren't they? Yeah, were. <laughs> Take a look at the poverty rate. Take a look at the health rate. Take a look at the lack of education. You would say 200 years from now, them people were enslaved, weren't they? Yeah. This is how slavery was 300 years ago. How can slavery exist for 300 years if you don't believe in it yourself? I don't even believe I'm saying that. How can slavery exist for 300 years if you don't believe in it? I could see it lasting for a week. Okay, a month. A year, then we revolted and got free. Okay, two years, we were slaves. Three hundred years. One hundred million Africans off the west coast of Africa. We weren't part of that? Nah, you gotta look at it today too. We still slaves today. It's just the slave population got bigger. It's now Asian and Europeans part of it too now. Now it's Latinos as well. And now it's uh, Arabs and Hindus and yeah. This is a slave population got bigger. It didn't go nowhere because it was always a mental issue to begin with. Why are you a slave? Because I believe that my father and my mother are my God. I believe in my culture and I don't need to believe in yours. Okay, put these chains on, let's go. I get here to America. I'm still looking for my ancestors. I'm still praising the ancestors. The white man is calling it voodoo. They call me Yoruba and all kind of other things, but this is just my ancestry. But here in this system, I can't be myself. There goes spirituality. You are a god in your environment. You are the god of your environment. You're not the god of the universe. You're not, this, no, but you are the God, the creator of your environment. And your environment is as large as your perception is. When I was in the Bronx, my environment was global. I was homeless with two nothings in my pocket. But I knew this science. I was raised by a strong woman, that's all I got to say. Strong woman, her name is Jacqueline Parker. If you ever meet her, give her a dollar. She's a strong woman, my mother. And she raised me, I was eight years old. She never told me to turn the music off. 
In fact, when we was rapping and beating on the walls and the neighbors was complaining, she bought us Rapper's Delight. She bought us Funky 4 Plus One more. Encouraged the hip hop in us. We didn't even know what it was, but moms was just unconditional love. And we was crazy. Me and my brother Kenny, crazy in Brooklyn. Crazy. But my moms loved us anyway. And this is what I'm saying to all mothers in this room right now. Your daughters, your sons, if you keep that love on them, they're going to be greater than anything you could possibly imagine. And this is the point, greater than you can imagine. <laughs> this is the scary part, mom. This is it. Your kids are greater than you can imagine. When you give them love, you make them greater than you can imagine. My mother could not imagine KRS-One. I was 12 when I told her I was going to be a rapper. I was 12. I said, Ma, I'm going to rap. She said, OK, yeah, let's get to the dishes. <laughs> That's how she just went, just like that. I said, Ma, I'm going to be a rapper. OK, yeah, we'll take out the garbage. Years later, here I am, we laugh about it now. I used to tell my brother all the time, yo, you're not playing your part in the movie. You know they're gonna do a movie about us? This is way back in the, we like nobodies. But I had this knowledge. My mother used to turn me on to Ernest Holmes, Science of Mind, James Allen, As a Man Thinking. She used to crack the Bible open on us, not, not, not every day, on Christmas and Easter. She used to open the Bible and talk about the birth of Christ. Not Jesus, Christ. What Jesus was called. That thing goes way back into history. She used to teach us about that. So mom, you are the center of not only this universe genetically, spiritually, but also culturally. Hip-hop is the way it is today being portrayed in media because of women. Moms taught us that we're a bitch. We was in the other room when moms was talking to her girlfriends. This bitch thinks she's crazy. We was in the room listening to moms. Where else did we get our language from? You could say the streets, but that's only other kids listening to their moms. Mom, you are the first teacher. If there's any activism to be done in this country, it is a return to motherhood on all levels. On all levels, from God to the parent. Mothers, at the least, America could boast that it's getting rid of sexism once and for all. It could boast that it's getting rid of racism because of Barack Obama's presidency. It's, it, it hasn't, but it can boast it can say, we're on our way. Uh, we got more work to do. Uh, we got the, you could at least boast it with, with, with Barack Obama, President Barack Obama's presidency. You could boast that. With Hillary Clinton, you could also boast the power of women. For four more years, and with her, that first four years, more than the men in this audience, because society caters to men. Let me keep that, keep that. Men in this audience, the American society caters to you. The American society does not cater to women. It holds women back, holds women down, and makes women believe they're supposed to be held down. Women are guilty. Women are afraid, insecure, depressed. This is why our communities can't rise. It's because our mothers are sick. Even if the father rose up, it's useless without the mother useless and i'm a father i have all respect for fatherhood manhood no doubt but manhood is nothing without womanhood nothing nothing men don't make women women make men and women <laughs> so when we can realize when we can realize change the paradigm and then you'll see your reality change there's no revolution for everybody. I'm going to fight the revolution and we're all going to get justice. That's a myth. Here's the truth. 
Revolution only works for those that participate in it. That's it. This is why you have some people who make it because they participate in their own revolution. Other people are waiting for someone to tell them who they are, why they are, and where they should go. And this is an issue of character, so there's no judgment. There's no judgment. If that's your character, that's your character. But here's my character. It's called hip-hop. And that character believes in itself. That character creates its own reality. That character takes words and languages and flips them to match its consciousness, not the world's. Doing that, I create a, a world for myself that I can eat, have joy, peace, love, unity. This is the whole of hip hop. This is what makes you a hip hopper. Thanks for listening. It's so great to have Sarah Ford here at Cal State Los Angeles. Sarah Ford. And you know what we're going to do on behalf of everybody? Cal State Los Angeles, Associated Students Incorporated, we want to participate, give you a certificate of recognition for advancing the dialogue about race, violence, social structure, the need to contemplate and develop a cross cultural worldview, and appreciation of a unique, dynamic insight, and the encouragement of a new and progressive movement. We commend and applaud you for your social activism. Check, check. All praise to the most high. 